once again to discuss things. Welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I'm Super 2. Joining me today is the real Manos. Hey, I'm the real Manos. Yes, yes you are. Um, oh, I'm still echoing a bit, man. Hold on, hold on. Sure, sure, sure. Anyway, as as he gets that ready, I'll, I'll try to explain what we're going to talk about to the people. Um, okay. So Manos sent out a tweet talking about a particular thing, and it made me think about a particular thing. And I'm not quite sure how to describe this, but the best estimation I can come up with is thinking about people that have passed away that made great art in different forms using modern material, whether that be modern technology or, moder- or putting their spin on a modern property. And I'm not sure how much mileage we'll get out of it, but it's been something kind of kicking around in the back of my head lately, and Manos made me think of it, so he got to come on for this. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so why don't you explain what you were talking about? Uh, wow, it didn't sound at all that smart. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, I, I believe you're talking about how, um, I was doing a series of tweets last night about uh, Ghost in the Shell. I have recently watched of uh, the uh, most recent anime film, uh, Ghost in the Shell, the new movie, which is the most brilliant uh, subtitle I've ever heard <laughs> in my life. How, how fucking lazy is that as a as a subtitle? Like, hey, what are we gonna call the uh, the new uh, Ghost in the Shell movie? I don't know. Fuck it. Let's the just call new it the Ghost in the Shell movie. Let's just call it the new movie. I don't fuck. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I can't wait to watch this movie 20 years from now, and it'll still be called that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's, I started, like, doing a series of tweets about it, and, um, I couldn't help but think, um, I, you know, I wonder what Stanley Kubrick would have done with this story, or this material, or this universe. Um, because it approaches some of the things he's talked about in, uh, <laughs> some of his works, and, um... The line, uh, essentially, uh, between like humanity and what we are, and what makes us who we are, is it our memories and accumulated ideas that make us who we are, or are we a soul in and of itself? And I, I just love all that discussion in Ghost in the Shell, which is one of the things why I like it so much. And um, I'm just curious what he would have done with that material. Uh, I'm. I, I don't know what he would have done with it. I It would be interesting to see him do a film with a female lead. Because uh, I don't... Yeah, I don't especially given the way he treated actresses. Yeah, so it might have been Balto's uh, <laughs> movie. Uh, <laughs> Certainly. Which would not please me at all. But, you know, um, I would just be interested to see what he would do with that material. And I guess that started you thinking, like... Uh, other passed on, I guess, filmmakers dealing with modern material? Not just filmmakers, because, like, uh, a thought I was kicking around a couple months ago, you know I me, mean? I like to do my CG, 3D computer modeling, all that stuff. Yeah, I've noticed that. And a couple months back, I was reading through Jack Kirby's original Black Panther, and I remember reading through his New Gods, when, you know, he was writing and drawing it, and... That dude just really had a very strong sense, uh, or really loved to play with geometric shapes and objects. Yeah. It's all over the place. Like, you know, there were stories of him, like, taking apart television sets to draw the, like, different components and stuff. Um, and so the the interesting thing about 3D modeling that, that sets it off from uh, uh, standard 2D animation is volumetric shapes, cubes, spheres, cylinders, stuff like that. It can maintain a consistent form when you animate it because you're just creating it the one time 
and then moving the physical, like digital physical object, and then rendering that out. And so, like that's the the example I always go to is you'll rarely see an extended shot in a 2D animated film of a train. And if you do, it's the animator showing off because that is damn near impossible to get right. Because you have, you know, all these different things to maintain a consistent line and, and a vanishing point and all this shit. It's, it's a nightmare. But that's like one of the easiest things conceivable to do in 3D animation because it's just making a bunch of things linked together moving toward the camera or whatever. Yeah. And so I just, I, I was thinking on a similar line, just like what would Jack Kirby do with the ability to, to just, you know, make a cube and then put lines on it anywhere he wanted to and then, like, do extrusions and, and to create depth on it and texture it. And I just, I really think that he was a person that if he could have learned, survived long enough for the programs to be as accessible as they are now, and if he could have learned how to use them, you know, old guys and computers rarely mix, if he could have learned how to use them, I think he could have created some truly breathtaking stuff that, you know, frankly, we don't see a lot of really innovative things that you can only do with CG done with CG. Um, I'm a big fan of people using the the medium that they're working in to create something that can only work in that medium, and I think Jack Kirby would have definitely been capable of that. That's actually interesting. I've never considered what Kirby would do with 3D animation uh, until you just brought it up. Because um, he's always... He was always someone who seemed to really look towards the future and mm. be really inspired by it. Uh, which is always so funny because he always had this kind of <sighs> awe about him. Like, he was such an old-school kind of grumpy guy. Yeah. But you read his work, and, you know, it had just... It had these lofty goals and expectations to, to you know, what sci-fi could be. Mm -hmm. Man was an idea factory. He was. Um, and, you know, I don't love Kirby's writing. I think he's got dialogue issues at times, particularly when, like, you get... Like, when it's, you know, reading the Fourth World Omnibus... Um, his dialogue between the new gods and everything was great, but when you get to, like, actual people, it just that's not how people talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, honestly, he, he was just a really imaginative individual, and I, I don't know what it is specifically about this idea, and I don't really want this video to just be, like, a list of, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this person could do this thing? I just kind of wanted to discuss some of the, the ideas of why it is we think of this. Because I, I don't know, I find myself thinking about stuff like this from time to time. Like, not even people that have passed on, but that's just where it's it's most notable because, guess what, they didn't do it, so it's not going to happen. Um, but, like, why it is that we, we think of, wouldn't it be great if this person could work on this thing? Yeah. Um, and I, I you're not alone to think that I, I I have a series on my channel uh, about retro casting where I take mm -hmm. actors from the past and put them in you know superhero movies in the present you know and I thought about that quite a bit I, I and it's sometimes some of these artists occasionally I look back at some of these artists uh, particularly the ones we lost um and I just wonder like what they would have been able to do with um, different opportunities and technologies because uh, some of my favorite, like, classic Golden Age, like, actors and, and directors and such, you know, worked under the, the uh, Hayes Code. Mm. And, you know, they would have to kind of, like, you know, play along. And I know Hitchcock constantly wanted to stretch the boundaries of what you could do during his period. Um, so I know that's not – I know he wasn't the only one. I know they all wanted – a lot of them wanted to, you know, stretch the boundaries – of what they can do and get away with. And, uh, I, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see what um, uh, Ray Harryhausen mm. uh, could do. I know his field was uh, stop animation. Although, to be honest, with what stop animation is doing today, I'd love to see what he would do. Um, yeah, did you see Kubo by chance? I still haven't seen Kubo. Oh, it's so good. I, I guess it's so good. It looks fantastic. I just haven't had a chance to see it. And uh, 
you know, I'm a huge fan of Coraline. I think that film is amazing. And mm-hmm. uh, God, it'd be amazing if he if he were like alive today. And could just and, not even necessarily be the one working on it, but just if some of these creators could see what their um, work actually led to. Yeah. Could be fascinating. That would be um, wonderful. Like, I, would, I do know he lived at least long enough to see uh, uh, you know, some of the work that came after him. Mm-hmm. Um, although I don't know what he would have to say about it. I've never heard him talk about, like, say, Nightmare Before Christmas or anything like that. Yeah, I gotcha. Uh, but I would... You know, I would love to see him, like, you know, it'd been great if he could work on a studio film like that, where it's, you know, not not animal, not monsters mixing it up with humans. I mean, just a full, you know, stop animation stop film. God, I mean, that's just, I just, can't, I can't even begin to think what he would do with that. Yeah, it's it's just interesting that, that your mind drifts to these things, because the creators were limited by either the technology of the time. And, you know, a lot of people... When they're talking about movies or or problems with you know different things, rarely take into consideration the context of the time they were made. Um, you know, everyone gives George Lucas all kinds of of trash for what he did to his own trilogy and and stuff like that, and he certainly deserves a fair amount of it. But yes, yes, he does. <laughs> But at the same time, I, I do have some sympathy for that. Like, I've looked at my own work that I've done in the past and gone, wow, that sucked. What were you thinking? And, like, I've, I've been tempted to want to go back and, and touch it up with what I know now. And I, I can understand that temptation to want to improve what you've done in the past, even if other people don't see it as an improvement. And, you know, I'll, I'll defend some of the subtle changes made in the uh, original Star Wars trilogy special editions. I won't defend all of them. Not even going to try that one. Yeah. Um, you can't defend all of them. You can't defend oh, some. No. Yeah, I mean, like, I'll, I'll defend to, to the death replacing the Emperor from uh, Empire Strikes Back. The 80s version looks like straight garbage. Uh, I'll I'll defend that one to the grave. <laughs> well, the fact that you know they put monkey eyes on him to give him yep. this weird kind of look, and then it didn't stay consistent. You know, he didn't look like that in the next film. So out of consistency, I'm totally cool with doing that. Yeah, it just it doesn't look good. Um, so you know stuff like that, and 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 so I understand the temptation for creators to go back to their own work, but there's something else to this idea of what if this person who was never around for this kind of technology could use it for their own work? And I'm trying to just think of other examples, like, or, or just more, more generally, like what if, you know, I hate to stick to Kubrick, but since you brought him up, if, if we ever were to get a new gods movie coming out at the same time, the comics (laughs) Kubrick would have been my pick to direct it. I think he could have done some amazing shit with that. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's just no no way the current WB studio would let him. Well, I don't, I don't know if they would let him do it. I mean, if Kubrick returned from the grave, specifically went to WB and said, "I'm making a new God's movie," I don't <laughs> think they could argue with him, right? <laughs> I suppose so. I, it's just like, well, I don't know, Kubrick. You know, you don't have enough dumb songs that, you know, we could stick into a trailer. <laughs> and, you know, don't forget, you got to put sequel bait in it and um, make all the characters Batman. So don't forget to do all that. Yep, yep. I want to see the Metron version of Batman. Yeah. Uh, no, but, like, that's just, he, he had the right kind of sensibility to, like, let things be <sighs> weird. Yeah. And... And not explain everything, and that's kind of the sensibility that I think you'd need with the the fourth world stuff. Um, and and so I don't know what it is about, like, you know, people thinking what could be because we see this not just with people that have passed, but like, you know, how many videos have you seen where people are going, "Oh, I want this actor to play the Joker or whatever." Yeah, yeah, that's like really common. And so there's there's something about. 
your ability to imagine other people doing stuff. And I do this all the time. I was on Twitter the other day, and I was like, hey, DC, let Tom King write Green Lantern Earth 1. Yeah. <laughs> Get on that. <laughs> um, because that's just... I, I'm kind of in love with Tom King's stuff right now, and I don't think that they've announced who's if we're even going to get a Green Lantern Earth One book. But I know he wants to write Green Lantern Hal Jordan, so mm-hmm. there'd be a perfect matchup. Um, I don't know. It's 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 just a weird thing that I think we as people do, we as fans do. Maybe I don't know how many people that aren't you know devoted to a fan base do this crap. I actually know it. I take that back because. There's like, um, you know, there's fantasy football, and there are like people who talk about, oh, well, in their prime, this football player or whatever would have wiped the floor, or this boxer, yada, yeah. yada. Yeah, uh, that's actually kind of where I've gotten it from, is sports fans have been doing this for years. You know, sports fans used to debate, like, you know, when Mike Tyson was big, people would talk about, like, oh, you know, if ha- Muhammad Ali was in his prime fighting. Tyson, who would win that fight, and, you know, they would talk about that all the time, uh, you know, with different sports teams, you know, football, baseball, and shit like that, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I naturally, like, think, well, oh, man, like, you know, how cool would it have been to see Bella Lugosi play Hannibal Lecter? Oh, my fucking God. Holy shit, yes. Just give me that all day. <laughs> I mean, good lord. I mean, that's kind of where I started thinking about it. Like, oh, man, that would have been an amazing film. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd watch the shit out of that. Um, Me, too. Me too. I think he would be a better... I think he would be a better <laughs> lector than Hopkins, actually. Um, and those are fighting words, too. I know. But... Well, look, I'm a, I'm a big Lugosi apologist. I love that guy. Um, <laughs> and, jeez, uh, I mean... Uh, and, you know, then it, you know, kind of still went from there, you know, which is why I kind of do a series, like, talking about this every so often. I, I mainly stick to actors. I don't really talk so much about um, other types of artists, like filmmakers and animators and, and artists, mm-hmm. um, musicians as well. But uh, I've been kind of focusing on one thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, uh, it's interesting. I, it's interesting to see what Kubrick would have done with uh, New Gods. Um, it would have been interesting to see what Fritz Lang would have done with New Gods. Mm-hmm. Um, just someone with some sort of fucking imagination. Yeah, you really, you would need someone who just isn't afraid to be creative as fuck. Um, what was the name of the guy that did Melancholia? Um, oh, yeah. Lars von Trier. Yeah. I, I wouldn't put him on New Gods, but I, I could imagine, like, if he got a hold, and he could have conceivably done this before he died, but... Um, if, if he got a hold of, like, some really dark n- noir kind of, uh, you know, popular characters, like, I, I would like to see him do something, you know, Batman's the go-to, but just to be a little more creative, I'll, I'll say, like, question. Um, yeah. Though, my, my pick is still Quentin Tarantino to direct a question movie. I, I mm-hmm. still think Suicide Squad could have been a fantastic film if Quentin Tarantino directed it. <laughs> I, I'm still like that's the only guy who could have made that film. Um, he would have made it work. He would have done it on his terms. Uh, the movie's attitude could have like written. He's not a big fan of like superhero films. Um, for what, what I've heard is he really wants to do one, but the fans are just too unforgiving, so that he, he'd never be able to do his own thing. Well, that's the thing. Well, Sui- Suicide Squad would have been the film to do. Um, or maybe an uh, maybe a Garth Ennis project or something like that because Garth Ennis hates superheroes too. So that would have, <laughs> that would have been the thing to do. But I mean, Suicide Squad would have been perfect because they're villains and it's a team and you know they're put together and he could have like you know instead of the sloppy way their backstories are put together, he could have done it just so beautifully and interwoven it into the plot. And yeah, damn it, <laughs> damn it, damn it, damn it, just a missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and, like, I, I just pick, like, Lars von Trier because, you know, Melancholia is a very beautiful, um, like, tragically depressing film, but it's supposed to be. It, it was von Trier's um, send-off to his depression, and so I just, I think that someone who can do something so ground, or so profound like that, I think he could do some really 
you know, like when we say dark, we we now we've commercialized darkness, unfortunately. Yeah, not superficial bullshit darkness. Um, I mean, real darkness. Yeah, yeah, and you know, or, or like this is a weird thing to say, but like a Rorschach solo movie. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that would be the kind of project for him. Yeah. Um, not that I'd necessarily want that, but hey. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's it's something that I think people just do that are fans of things because we, we want, I, I think what this is, is we want our, I'm going to use the term loosely, heroes to be around forever and make stuff forever, but the fact is they're just people, so they can't. So I think it's particularly interesting with, you know, superhero characters who are in their own way immortal. You know, Batman never really ages, even though he's always older than everyone else around him. Um, yeah. You know, that like, we have these immortal characters that are just around, and then we have these very mortal people who have fantastic um, senses of vision of what something can or should be, and they just never got together on a thing, and so it's it's kind of that what could have been um, mentality that I don't know. I just find it fascinating to think about, and I I kind of find myself my mind drifting to this from time to time. I do it too, and uh, it's almost tangible because a lot of the characters we talk about are from DC and Marvel and these characters often existed while these people were still on Earth, while these mm -hmm. people were still alive. You know, Batman has been around since, you know, 30, uh, 30 you know, 39. You know, Wonder Woman's been around since 40, like, 1. Or, um, so, yeah, it's... It feels like that this could have happened, but, it uh, you know, there was a funny uh, fake story floating around that, um, that uh, Orson Welles was was pitched a Batman movie or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, people believed it for a little while. Um, it's like, no, no, it's just a bullshit story. <laughs> oh. I'm trying to remember the name of this um, guy that... I think it might have been Cary Grant. Um, one of the the OG um, Batman artists from the, the Golden Age talked about how whenever he drew Batman, he based him off Cary Grant. I'm pretty sure it was Cary Grant. Don't quote me on that, though. I did. Too bad. Too late. Oh, okay. Well, now I'm just a liar. I'm going um, to write that on Twitter right now. <laughs> it says. <laughs> uh, no, but, like, it's, it, it's just interesting to think of, like, you do the retro casting. What if Cary Grant or someone like that, uh, you know, got the chance to play Batman and do it straight. Yeah. And you know, audiences weren't ready for something like that back in the day. And to be honest, the comics weren't ready for something like that back in the day. But correct, because uh, like every you know everybody talks about how campy and goofy the the Batman '66 show was. Well, that was of the time, man. You know, uh, that's kind of how you know Batman was, especially during the fucking '50s. Mm -hmm. Um, and then coming. I mean, that's when Batmite was introduced. Yeah, and Bat Baby. Look, you know the fifties. Bat Baby. That's a new one. No, to me. It's oh, it's bad. Um, <laughs> it's amazing that the Trinity made it out through the through the fifties at all intact. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fifties was a really really bad time. I mean, everybody talks about how bad the nineties were. Nineties were like fucking golden age compared to um to the 50s ouch um oh yeah well at least in terms huh. at least in terms of superhero comics uh the 50s yeah, was yeah. a good growth uh for horror comics yeah i love me some tales uh and other types of comic uh oh speaking of which I, i'm not sure if you're aware but there is a new tales from the crypt book coming out right now oh yeah yeah um just random little bit of information for you <laughs> okay well well thank you uh huh. Um, keep not keep your eyes open for it on the the stands next time you go. Um, but yeah, you're you're right that like comics needed to evolve to a point where like these kind of these gods of the industry because we're not just talking about like you know random schmucks in Hollywood that you know would have necessarily taken a project like that. We're talking about these people who got to pick and choose who they played, right? Yeah. Um. So it's just like, 
you you wouldn't have like we talk about oh well they could have because the character was around at the time but the character needed to evolve yeah. to a status where they could yes yeah batman was not batman you know by you know 1950 or something like that you know he was a different batman and not i don't know just not on the radar of of, of kind of like performers and artists to that level. He was the thing that, you know, you, you shit out in those serials. They were two, there were two clunky serials and, you know, that was it. Yep. Yeah. And so it's, it's like, it's tempting to think about what could have been, but in reality it, it would never have happened. And that's why it didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's just something interesting to dwell on. Um, and I don't, I'm not quite sure, like, what specifically makes us do it. You know, postulated a couple of things. Um, just to end out, round out the episode, let's talk about just a couple more of our, like, dream projects or dream people for, for different things. Uh, we've mostly talked about, like, Hollywood and stuff. I, like, Hollywood and filmmaking and stuff. I'm just also thought of this in, in relation to other people and I I would really like to see like um some some of the, the great writers just their takes on different things, not even to have them write like I would love to see what Shakespeare would think of Sandman. Especially given that he's a character in that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah, like it's just it's because Gaiman was doing a lot of things connected to literature, and we did a whole episode on Sandman, so people can go check that out if they want me to talk about, they want to hear us talk about it more. But you know, there's there's a lot about literature and the place of genius in that, and I think Shakespeare was onto a couple of the same things. I don't really like a lot of Shakespeare, but I'd just be curious what his thoughts on these kind of things would be if he he got to experience it the way we do. And then there's also the funny thing of, like, even if they were, like, magically put around now to be able to do stuff like this, you'd have to explain everything to them, mm-hmm. and no one would understand half of it. <laughs> okay, let, let me explain to you, uh, Mr. Shakespeare, what's been happening since uh, 400 years, 500 years? <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, so, well, you, you heard of America. Turns out it's really fucking big. Um... <laughs> Yeah, it got bigger and bigger. Um, oh, what's this? That's a cell phone. Let me let me let me get to the cell phone. <laughs> we got a while. Let me start. Just take your mind off. Of we're just we're on slavery right now. Right now, let me get to the cell phone in just a minute. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Like, I would I wonder what um, what someone like Mozart who was just really interested in experimenting with what you could do with music, and he he didn't have very much of a sense of pretentiousness about him. He he made fun of that aspect of the society in which he lived. I'd be curious what he would think of, you know, computerized music, because that gets, like, a lot of, a lot of shit from music critics. Oh, it's all done on computers, it's not really music. What if Mozart fucking did something with it, you prick? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mozart might be the biggest Skrillex fan. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> All right, have you got anybody else? Uh, let's see. Um, well, we've already talked about a couple of my wish lists. Um, uh, outside of, you know, acting, and I've already talked about that a little bit, and I have, like, several videos doing that. Um, so, I don't know. Again, you know, Tarantino doing... Suicide Squad is a big kind of wish list that unfortunately will never happen. Um, I'd love to see Chuck Palahniuk. Uh, he did a comic for Fight Club too. Um, mm. I'd love to see him work on Moon Knight. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm very curious to see what Rebecca Sugar does after Steven Universe eventually like uh, finishes its run, whenever that is. Um, mm. I'd be, oh, I'd kill to see her work on. I don't know. I, well, for, I mean. I don't know if she, you know she would stay in animation or just anything she would like to work in. Like, and I wouldn't. I would kill to see her do some sort of DC comic. Uh, you know, maybe Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, also, you know, Bruce Tim. I I've been one of those people who've been bitching about this for years. Like, 
that Bruce Timm should be in charge of the DC uh, film universe. I, I don't, I, it's amazing to me that they didn't hand it over to him. Um, so, uh, you know, those are kind of, you know, a little here and there. But, mm-hmm. uh, I'm always, I'm, I kind of always think down that road, like, you know, oh, in this kind of fantasy casting, like who mm-hmm. this and who would do that. Yeah, and it's just, it's, it's, I keep saying this, just a really interesting thing to dwell on and, and chew on in the back of your head sometimes, so... Uh, people watching this, leave comments down below of, of, you know, creators that you associate with, with different things that they never got the chance to do, or maybe people that can still do something. Who's, who's your wish, like your dream list? If you could sit next to, you know, this person on a plane, what would you ask them to do? Um, you know, just one of those things, uh, another one for me just came to my head. I really want to give James Earl Jones the Kieran Gillen Darth Vader run from Marvel that just finished up a couple months back and just convince him to make Fox make a movie. Mm. <laughs> because it's so good. <laughs> you know, I was always, you know, we recently lost Carrie Fisher. And, um, you know, she writes pretty good. Uh, I, I constantly, like, did she do any Star Wars kind of material? Uh, I don't think she did, did she? I have no idea. I know she, like, did the intro to the, um... Or, like, she she did the prelude, I think, to the Princess Leia comic. She did, like, a little introduction on it. Yeah. Um, not, like, writing the characters, just, like, a paragraph thing, whatever. Um, I don't know if she's ever, she'd ever done anything with the, like, actually writing the universe, though. Oh, uh, yeah. That'd have been interesting. Her stuff was more satirical and more realistic, so I don't know if it was just in her literary wheelhouse to, you know, do epic fantasy stuff, but, uh, mm. I don't know, I, when they were starting to do, when Marvel's starting to do, uh, new comics again, I was thinking, mm. oh man, how cool would it have been if they could get <laughs> Princess Leia to write a Princess Leia book, or, or, you know, some something. Yeah, I mean, it couldn't have been any worse than the one they put out. Let's see. Oh, really? The, you didn't yeah. like the Mark Wade one? No. No. Not at all. Oh, Okay. It was so useless. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, um, unfortunately, hate hate to admit it. It's got a couple cool moments here and there, but no. Unfortunately. Well, anyway, just... my point is it would have been interesting to see what she would do with the character. Um... Yeah, now you just got me ranting about something that annoyed me, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. All right. Well, I think that'll do it, though. Yep, um... It sure is. <laughs> Uh, that'll do it for the episode. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. Until next time, I'm the Philosopher. And I'm the real Manos, who has no bullshit name. Yeah, you you should work on that, huh? Oh. I'm the, <laughs> oh, I, I'm the realist. There you go. There you go. I like that. That's a good one. Done. It's happened. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things. Ba-do, ba-do.